New day, new goals, let's own it. It's a beautiful night in Vegas, but we're getting ready to get into a new episode to go meet up with one of the leaders that I have looked up to as such an amazing role model. He is top 50, under 50, one of the wealthiest people on this planet right now. He's a peak performance expert, global sought after motivational speaker. He is somebody that lives the character of a real leader. He's built an unbelievable community through his branding, Max Out. We're getting ready to go and hang out with him in his mansion, one of multiple mansions, on the water in Laguna Beach. Let's get to it to meet up with my boy, Ed Milet. brother thank you so much man this is like i can't even tell you how inspired <laughs> i am right now mm -hmm. um i'm glad to have you here brother jeez man it's See, my honor i mean it's, it's four seasons i've interviewed so many different people mm -hmm. but you're someone that i i really look up to thank you when i finally got to meet you mm -hmm. you mentioned something to me and i wanted to wait till till we we were on camera to say this but yeah brother your spirit is something that I've seen mm. even before really even coming here and meeting you in person. Thank you, brother. You know, like I really see that side of you. And mm. there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there mm. that get to, I mean, you're top 50 of mm. wealthiest people mm. of under 50 years old. Mm -hmm. You you accomplish so many different things. But the way that you shine, man, your heart for others, thank you. And the way that you've opened up, I know that that's just that's really, really special. And I just want to say, man, thank you, brother. I think that's probably why you and I have such a good connection because you know I'm an admirer of yours too. So I love when there's someone I've admired from a distance that I meet him and then they exceed my expectations because not everybody does, right? Yeah. Right when I met you, I told you, I'm like, oh, I get it. I already got it. I know why this guy's so big time because it's your spirit. So I'm uh, I'm really thrilled we've connected. Thank really, you. really. Thank thrilled. you so much. I guess like I want to first ask you. Um, because the crew, the community, they're watching this, but you know, when you're here, you know, and yeah. I, the, I've seen the, the home in Coeur d'Alene's, I'm yeah. now here in Laguna, and I, you're, you're giving me this tour, and I'm just like walking through and hearing, <laughs> but then I'm like, man, this guy built this up from scratch. Like, yeah. how does that really, really feel? Like, on a day to day basis, <laughs> right. like, how does that really feel for you? Uh, you know what? Because I know you know about this too. It's amazing. I mean, I'm. I'm telling you, we were up, we were up there earlier on the balcony, and you went, you took in the ocean air, you know. And I said to you when you did it, I said I do that almost every single day. So I do pinch myself still. I grew up, I didn't grow up that far from here, so I would see people. I thought, who are these people that live in these houses? You know what I mean? Like, who are they? Did they all inherit this money? Like, are they like Martians? So to actually be in a place like this, there's a part, there's two parts of it. Honestly, there's a part of me that feels like I belong here yeah. because I don't, your mind moves towards what it's most familiar with. So I've been living somewhere like this for years, even though I didn't physically live here right. in my mind, right? In my spirit, I'd visit these places. I dream about it. So over time, I kind of started to fool myself into thinking I belong here. But candidly, there are a lot of mornings I wake up and I go, I just cannot even believe I'm here because as you know, I have these weird things I'm grateful for. When I was really coming up in business, I went so broke that powers turned off, you know, the phones turned off. I had my wife's car got repoed. You can have all that happen to you, but what you don't want to ever have happen is have your water turned off. And I had the water turned off in our apartment right when we were newlyweds. And I just remember the shame of every morning getting up with her. We'd have to walk down the stairs to the pool outdoors and take our shower, brush our teeth in that outdoor shower then grab our stuff up. I'd walk my new bride up to our apartment and it was just shameful for me, you yeah. know? And so I'm grateful to live here. And this is, sounds corny, but I'll just tell you the honest to God truth. It's not every single morning, but there are many mornings when I pull the faucet in the shower and the water hits me and I'm, that's where the gratitude hits me. I'm like, it's got my water. Not yeah. just the ocean back there, but just literally that, you know, I know what that's like to yeah. be scared. Yeah. I wasn't just broke, I was scared. So I want to know, how would you feel if you were like Ed and you were in that position? You had that shame. You were newlyweds and you were so broke that your water got turned off. Maybe you're at that moment right now. Maybe you've been in a moment like that. But are you actually going to allow that to determine your path, your future, your destiny? Or are you going to be like Ed and max out? 
become one of the wealthiest people in the world. I want to know if you're not going to ever allow anything that's stripped away from you to ever determine your destiny. I want you to comment max out. There's all these techniques you and I teach people, yeah. but my real confidence comes from the fact that I know God's got my back. Yeah. I know that I come from the King of Kings, yeah. and I know that there's great DNA running through my blood because I'm a descendant of my Lord, right? Yeah. And so that's where my real confidence comes from is I feel protected. I feel favored. I feel safe. I feel like everything's going to work out okay. Yeah. You know, and I remind myself of that. My prayer does that every day. I just fill myself with gratitude, just like you do. Yeah. So same thing. Yeah, and the other thing that um, that I think I relate to you about is I, my family also grew up middle class. Yeah. You know, they were just hard workers. Yep. We weren't poor. Yep. We weren't rich. We just, you know, it was like they we were surviving. We were good, and and but we, I was, I was, I had so much love and compassion. Like yeah. I think that's what I was really blessed with. Me too. You know, and. Um, I feel like that helped ground me, but you had, I remember, you know, hearing that you, you talking about the fact that it almost was tough for you kind of growing up middle class as well, because yeah. it isn't, you don't have that hunger and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Like I, it's, I had a weird upbringing. So I grew up middle class, so I don't think that's a great, I don't think there's any perfect place to be raised, but I do have this theory that if you're raised with a success around you, I think you can model those behaviors. Your family probably has some connections. Um, you're used to good things. Right. Achievement's probably important in that family. So that's kind of a positive thing. If you're poor, like my buddies that grew up really poor, they're successful. They knew exactly what they didn't want. And didn't want. They were fighting from a young age. They were grown up sooner, tougher sooner, more resilient sooner. The middle is average, and the enemy of great is good, right? And so I had that going on. I also had alcoholism in my family. So although financially we were somewhat decent, yeah. there was um, anxiety all the time in my home. My dad's sober now, but my dad had a pretty severe drinking problem that I've talked a lot about. So I know what it's like to grow up in a family with anxiety and dysfunction, or maybe everyone else thinks you guys are a great family, but inside there was love. There was, my dad just had an addiction, yeah. right? And so my dad's been sober for 30 years now. And, and, but, but that addiction, when you're a child and having that dysfunction, whether your parents get divorced or there's alcoholism or you know, anything like that in your family, I relate to that, mm -hmm. right? And um, that all happened for me. It serves me. I'll tell you a funny story. My family's so middle class. There's no priority in my family on material things or achievement, none. Yesterday, my dad lives 10 minutes. I have a Falcon 900 jet. It's the it's just an amazing jet, right? And I'm pretty proud of it. And um, my dad and mom live in Chino, where my pa my plane's getting painted. So I call my dad and I say, "Hey, dad, I'm coming up t t tomorrow to Chino. It's 10 minutes from my dad's house." I said, "Hey, um, the pa the plane's getting painted. I'm coming up to Chino." He goes, "Oh, good. Hey, yeah, come by and see me when you're done." And I go, uh, "Dad, do you do you want to see the plane?" <laughs> Like, do you have any interest? I've, I've had three airplanes. My father's never seen one of them. Doesn't want to fly on them, could care less. It doesn't matter to him at all. And I go, Dad, it's 10 minutes. He goes, yeah, I guess so. Do you want to take me? So I pick him up. We drive over. Very nice. You know, like, sometimes in life you think, I'm going to do all these things to really impress my family. Yeah. My family's not impressed with material things wow. at all, which probably keeps me grounded, as you, you know, said, right? You know, that's so crazy because I actually didn't, this is something really, you know, something that really touches me because I started realizing about three years ago, when I turned 30 years old, mm. it was right when I had my So successful, my so young, so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> and my, um, I realized that my entire life I've been trying to prove something to my, to my family. Yes. And I feel like everybody kind of has that in them. And, and it's like, it's whether it's like the teacher, and I've had that too, mm -hmm. right, that doubts you, or, or it's like, you know, the haters you may mm -hmm. have as friends, mm -hmm. or, you know, yep. you know, it's just people around you, or even yourself, but like, I realized that I never had anything to prove to him or to anybody else. Isn't yeah. that crazy when you get like that? Yes, uh, your insight for your age blows my mind because I'm the same way. Still to this day when I do things, I think, I want to tell my dad. Right. You know, you still want to make your parents proud of you. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I would call that, trying to prove people wrong or right about you is a cheap level of motivation. Right. And it will wear out. In other words, it's not, it's not the lack of it. It's just, it's not the best type. People say, well, hey, Tom Brady, six-round draft pick. I mean, he's constantly trying to prove them that they picked the wrong guys. 
I know Tommy a little bit, and I can tell you, that motivates him. But if you think he's become the greatest football player of all time because he's trying to prove people from 20 years ago wrong about where he was drafted, right. you don't get elite performance. Tom Brady is where he is because he sets standards for himself and has massive goals and ambitions to, for himself, not to prove other people wrong. I promise you, when he's sitting under center in the Super Bowl, he's not going, I was a six-round draft pick. That's not what moves him. Yeah. And so I think it's low-level motivation. I do it, too. And the sooner you drop, it's, it's, a, it's the symptom of the same disease. Right. So proving your family wrong or right is a symptom of the same disease, which is you are still obsessed with what other people are thinking about you and yeah. not doing things that make you happy, that enrich you, that fulfill your soul. And so the irony about spending your life worrying about what everybody else thinks about you, here's the irony, is that those people will never be thought about after they're dead. So they spend their life obsessing with everyone thinks about them only to die and have no one ever remember them because people that are so obsessed with what other people think about them never really ever fulfill their potential so once you can drop that addiction whether it's friends strangers or your parents and you begin to do things that fulfill you that make you happy yeah. that change other people's lives by yeah. your contribution now you can be remembered mm -hmm. now your your life echoes into eternity even if it was a quiet life right don't ever ever suffer from that same disease and that's something that yeah. is like exponentially grown correct because of social media Boom. and it's really affecting the youth now i mean i had someone on the show that really went in undercover to a high school mm. and they're so there's so much of this you know what we've all faced of this depression or anxiety and things of what mm. other people think and yep. you know judgment that they put on themselves it's like it's out of control so i think that message is it's so, it's so important. It, gerard it's it's the number one thing that scares me about our society i was about a thing a couple days ago and there was this daddy was yelling at his kids sit still stop doing that now take the picture, sit still. And then they take the picture wow. and he posed like they're this big, super happy family, right? And I went, my gosh, like we're fighting for these moments. Yeah. And the thing of doing my show, and I'm sure you've realized this too, like I just want everybody out there to know this. The thing that has shocked me about doing my show, and because you and I interview what the world would call successful people, especially in social media. The thing that has most surprised me, I was just telling my dad this last night when we were looking at my plane, um, I, is that the amount of depression and downness that even my guests suffer from in their own lives because of social media. In other yeah. words, this, this yearning to prove to everybody their life is perfect all right. the time. Right. And they really suffer from some depression off camera. They will tell me this. Yeah. It happens. I'm, I'm sure you oh, hear oh, it too. I've, I've suffered definitely from anxiety, from me. depression, but mm. also like sometimes it's just lonely. You got it. Loneliness, and that's, a, and that's a disease in itself. You're right. Wow. Do you want to go there for a second? Oh, yeah. Because I do too. I think it surprises people when um, I tell them, they go, oh, you seem like a positive guy, or you've got a great family and life and all that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but a lot of the time I do feel lonely too. And I think that's just part of the human condition. And the reason that I, when I feel the most lonely, I'm the most disconnected from my faith. Yeah. Um, I'm the most disconnected from me. And I'm always in, I'm, I'm, I've gone through these bouts of trying to prove people wrong right, or right, right or post the right thing or say the right. right thing. Or, you know, also once you become a public person, it's upholding a particular image even yeah. when you're out in public too. Well, also, I think it's a good intention. You know, you, yeah. you, you realize that it's not about you, it's about others. Correct. So most leaders that I've recognized, and I, I, again, just learned this not too long ago from a Navy SEAL. It was like a dream of mine to meet a Navy SEAL. Hmm. But I've, I've, I've felt, you know, again, my father wanted me to be this leader, right? So for so long, a leader for me, for such a long period of time was like, leaders eat last. Leaders are, you know what I'm saying? Everyone comes first and mm -hmm. all of these things. And, yep. and, and for a very long time, I didn't realize, wow. whoa, like, yep. hey, Gerard, you have to start taking care of yourself. You know, because there's so, a principle so to that. Long. There's a principle to that. Because if people quote these things, you know, even in the Bible where Jesus fed everybody else. And, right. And there's a principle at play there. But here's the, if you really want to be a leader, Okay, if you really want to affect other people, you really, truly, if you authentic, like you really want to affect me, here's the bottom line, okay, the bottom line, real effectiveness. You cannot transfer to me something that which you are not experiencing yourself. So you must first experience it before you can give it to me. So if you really want to experience energy, faith, passion, drive, discipline, achievement, you have to be experiencing it first to authentically transfer that to me. Yeah. So you can't always eat last. It can't always, you can't feed everybody else if you're starving. Yeah. Spiritually, emotionally, financially. You can't feed everyone if you're starving. Jesus could do it because Jesus was fed. He's Jesus. You're a human being. Okay, you're not a deity, and so you must be fed. You must be filled up before you can fill up for everybody else. It's such a absolute brilliant. In fact, it should be a book you write. Yeah, 
Thank it's you. the most well, misunderstood. First thing. book I'm writing yeah. is uh, it's, it's around that. It's yeah. around it's leaders create leaders. So, awesome. Yeah, awesome. I can't wait. Awesome. Um, what is that? What does leaders create creating leaders mean for you? Yeah, for me, um, I want people to, that I mentor to do better than me. So if you're in this thing where like that, you want people to do well around you, but you need to do better than them, you're really not leading people. So leadership is really simple. Here's how you lead somebody. Every human being, just even like what you're just describing yourself, is born with their natural giftedness. If you're a person of faith, I believe it was sown into you. But if you, just, you could just call it your talent if you don't have faith. So for example, it could be your ability to communicate, your heart, your spirit, your nurturing skills, your engineering skills, your math skills, your uh, discipline, right? Your whatever it is. You were born with natural giftedness. Here's what a great leader does. And it's, you'll be one of the rarest people on earth if you can do this for people. Just get quiet and observe people as a leader. And when you can identify what someone's two or three natural gifts are, and they're things they know intuitively to be true about themselves, and you link that gift to them achieving, you've built a leader. So if I said to you, it's your natural heart to serve people, brother. It's your unbelievable ability to communicate. It's your mom and her background in your ear that whole time supporting you, giving. You link, that's what you're gonna change the world. And you go, that, I, I do have a great mom. I do have a heart to serve. I do have a big spirit. And you link that to them, boom. Because here's the truth in life. Those of you that are listening, on one hand, if you're lucky, probably there's one or two fingers, you can count the person who that when you were a little boy or a little girl made you feel special knew you were special. Remember them? Just picture their face right now. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe it's your mother, or a coach, or your grandpa, or an uncle, or an auntie. And that's the one when you were a little boy or girl, they made you feel special. They knew you were different. They knew you were unique. They saw your blessings. They saw your gifts. Maybe you got one in your life. And when you picture their face, whether they've passed away or are still living, you get emotional. You can picture the times they made you feel that way, can't you? Right? Okay. If you're a great leader, you end up on that hand of thousands of people. So in my life, I want to be that person, one of them they picture. In my life, Ed Milet was this guy who saw how special I was. He saw my gifts. He saw my blessings. He told me over and over again how blessed and gifted I am. And he'd link that to me winning. It wasn't some rah-rah, you're going to do great, man. You're a champion. Go, go, go. No, no, no. It was deep. He would touch me in my spirit. He found my gift and my blessing. And when you're that person, you will be on the hands of someone in their life, one or two places, three places of their entire life. That's what a great leader does. That's why your mom's a great leader. It makes a great mom. What's a great mom? A great mom's someone who loves us, cares about us, believes in us, helps us. Love, care, believe, and help. That's what a leader does. I became a leader for the first time, not when I played baseball, but when I walked into McKinley because I started to love those boys and care about them and believe in them and I helped them and I tell them, Brian, you're a gift, you're so fast, you're so strong, you're so intense, man. He goes, I am, that's why you're gonna win, man. And Marcus, Marcus, it's your heart, you always wanna help everybody, you're such a good teammate, you care about everybody else, you always feed everybody else first. I do, don't I, Eddie? Yes, man, that's why you're gonna win, brother. And Ryan, Ryan, my gosh, you're so strong, you were just born strong, man, nothing gets you down, you fight all the time in school. And I do, don't I? And then I go over to Leroy, and Leroy, man, who's better at math than you? It's so, it's just your natural, I am good at math, that's why you're gonna win, you're an amazing scientist someday. I am? Yes, and he'd believe it. Same thing with adults. Those people in life stop telling us how special we are when we're about 10. And then you're just in the world and no one tells you anymore. So if you could do that for an adult, for an 18-year-old, for a 20-year-old, for a 25-year-old, they haven't had anybody show up in their life, maybe ever, but for sure for a decade, it goes, hey, dude, you're special, man. Let me tell you why you're special. This is what's amazing about you. That's a leader to me. And so I try to spread that everywhere I go. I watch people, I observe people, and then I tell them their gifts. One of the things that I admire most about Ed is he's constantly surrounding himself with some of the most powerful people in the world. I mean, he's hanging out with A-Rod, or he's friends with Tony Robbins, so many people that we all look up to. And you all know that I'm a huge advocate of mentorship or surrounding yourself with really powerful people because that'll elevate you to a whole new level. So I want to talk to him and ask him, what is it like to actually be friends and have these mentors in his life? And, and what is like an actual story of a mentor has really made an impact in his life. Who have those mentors been to you that have really helped you have breakthroughs? All my life, man. They've, I've sought them out. You know, I was a, um, I'm so glad you talk about these things because I've sought them too. Yeah. Because people, 
I want to turn my mentors into my friends. Like, you yeah. know how you and I are going to, we're going to become great friends because the highest level of influence is actually friend. Like if you have kids, anybody out there, the truth is, and most of you guys are so young, but you don't really worry about who their teachers are. That's their mentor. You worry about who they hang out with. You know mm. this from when you were a kid, That's right? So true. Friends. So you got to turn your mentors into friends long term. But for me, when I was a little boy, I played baseball. Miracle. I'm at a baseball camp. Rod Cruz there who's a Hall of Fame baseball player. He's, he's the guest coach at the baseball camp. All the other kids are, hey, can I get an autograph, blah, blah, blah. I went up to him and said, Mr. Crew, will you be my coach? I'm eight years old. Wow, eight will, years old. Will you be my coach? I'm this little left-handed hitter. He's Rod Crew. If you don't know who he is, Google it, right? And he goes, I might coach you. Let me see you hit. And I get in the cage, and I batted just like him. He used to bat with his bat flat like this instead of up, and I batted just like him. And he ends up meeting my dad, and he goes, you know, I was thinking of starting a hitting school. Why doesn't he be my first student? So when I'm eight years old, my hitting coach ends up becoming Rod Carew until I leave to go to college. Is that crazy? That's unbelievable. And then once I got into the business world, though, I knew that principle. And so I would start to put myself in environment. So Tony Robbins has been a major influence on me. Right. Um, but they so, start talk about that one because he sure. is someone that I I'm like I can't I'm enamored of the fact that you can like yeah. you you have that kind of close relationship with him that's yeah. a goal of mine he's mm -hmm. played such a big role and I very success. rarely meet somebody who's in this space that's successful who doesn't say Tony Robbins had a major influence on him right he's right. the OG he's the OG right everybody in this space comes from Tony somehow yeah. remember yeah. the coaching tree the the Bill Belichick coaching <laughs> tree yeah. everyone here is in Tony Robbins tree somehow yeah. it seems like right so but just that quote of success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. failure for me it's like I didn't know that for so long me too me to. He, uh, I, so I had a goal. My goal was I went to one of his seminars and I'm like, okay, well, that was cool, but I want to know him. And so over time, I sought him out, sought him out, sought him out. And then, you know, the way you get a mentor eventually, too, is that somehow there's reciprocity involved. You bring them some value. Yeah. You teach them something. You give them something they can't get, whether that's love, belief, care, time, admiration, whatever it is. So Tony's been a major one for me. Uh, Phil Knight's been a significant one for me. Uh, Stallone's been one. These are, you know, the point of my life now where those are guys that have made a major, major impact on me. But there's been lots of them in my business career along the way in my own company who yeah. the best people I, I want to learn. Uh, um, the way that I met A-Rod, people say, how do you know Alex? And the way that I met him was that through a mutual friend, Alex wanted to start a podcast. And he said, I'd like to learn best practices from you. To me, about doing a podcast, right? And so he even understands the principle of that, it, right? Dang, like, exactly. Where right. I'm always right. asking people for what they do well so that I can learn. I never want to feel like I'm the smartest guy in the room because right. I'm not IQ yeah. wise. So I'm always learning. And I, what mentors do for you is they not only teach you things, but they, they make you want to live up to their belief in them. And I think the other thing is they can hold you accountable differently than you can yourself because you don't want to let someone down whom you respect, the dad principle that you said earlier, right? So I haven't won in my life because I'm trying to prove something to Tony Robbins. But part of the steps of my life have been when I make a verbal commitment to him that I'm going to do something, I want to build a reputation with him that I keep my promises. Right. And that's different. Yeah. And so that's what my mentors have done for me, and I still seek them out yeah. all the time in whatever area that I'm moving towards. Um, I'm always trying to find out who's the best at this, who should I build a relationship with, who should I collaborate with, and even getting into this space. When meeting Grant Cardone initially was a big deal for me because he was a dominant player in the social media yep. influencer space, and I did my best to make sure that I fostered a friendship with him. And now we have a really great, you know, good friendship, the That's two of amazing. us. It's a funny one, but it's a, it's a good one. <laughs> yep, he was on season three. Yeah. Uh, I think it was season three. Yeah. Um, you you live by this term of max max out. Yeah. And I feel like it relates a lot to, you know, how I like to live, which is world class, mm -hmm. you know, which the definition is to be amongst the best in the world, to be at the highest caliber. Yes. Well what said. does max out really stand for for you? And when did that moment happen where you knew that that was going to be part of your brand? Yeah. Um, well, my son's name's Max, so that helped. Um, but maxed out to me means this, as you know. Um, your obsessions become your possessions. Whatever you end up being obsessed with, you'll eventually possess. So if you're obsessed with what you're worried about, your fears, your problems, you're going to possess those. And so I became obsessed. Um, the, the short version is, is that, and you don't know this, I don't talk about this on camera very much. When I was 30, my uncle died at 50 years old. And he was the guy in my family, we all have this, that you kind of resemble or remind everybody of. Oh, right. My yeah. dad's brother. He died at 50. Sorry. No, thank you. I appreciate that. It's a long time ago now. Yeah. And um, But he was kind of was my godfather, and in our Mike culture, that's a big deal. Of course, mine as well. Yeah, I know. And, Shout out uh, Uncle Mike. Yeah, mine was Uncle Mike. Wow. Whoa. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. It's got shells everywhere right there. Whoa, 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 whoa. 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 Man. That's how the universe works, right? Ooh. Wow, okay. You got me right there. So mine was my Uncle Mike. <clears throat> wow. And... Uh, oh, no, man. That just touched me. So, mine was my Uncle Mike. And uh, that blows my mind right there, brother. So, I'm, on, I'm at his funeral. <clears throat> We're flying back on the flight. There's this thing in your brain called the reticular activating system. It basically filters into your awareness what's important to you. That's why, like, if you buy a new car, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere on the freeway, three <laughs> lanes over on the other side. Boom, another one. They were always there. Why do you see them now? It's filtered into your importance. And heart attacks were it. My, he had died of a heart attack. And so I'm on the airplane, and I'm listening to music, and on the screen's the Oprah show, but I'm, it's in my awareness, and it's a heart on the screen. I'm like unplug my headphones, plug it into the phone system. And it was about a new heart scan that was happening at Cedar sinai where they could like, it's common now, but they could non-invasively look at your heart and your arteries. Long story short, I hear it and I told my wife, I said, schedule me for one of those exams. Yeah. She's like, it's expensive. I said, I don't care, schedule it. We call, it's a nine month wait. I go, I need to get in, I need to get in. I keep calling the lady. Finally, she goes, there's a cancellation tomorrow at two. I go, I'll be there. So I go down for the scan. And thank God this doctor understood influence and leverage. You do the scan, then you come back after lunch. I literally went, ate a burrito, came back. I wasn't in shape. I'm 30 years old. The doctor comes out and he goes, um, I'm, no, I'm looking for Edward Milet. I go, it's Milet, you know, and he goes, uh, he knew. And he goes, whoa, I can't believe these arteries are in that young a body. Wow. You need to come back, son. Now my heart's racing. I'm like, what the hell's in this skin? We sit down. Instead of what a normal doctor would do, they just go, hey, um, uh, here's the prescription. Take Crestor, work out, eat good, bye. He understood reasons is what changes people's lives. Massive reasons, not discipline, reasons and habits, right? He goes, let me ask you a question. Your wife's beautiful. Um, uh, do you have kids? I go, yeah. I go, I got a son. He's one. He goes, that's great. Um, do you want to be there when he graduates high school? I went, what? He goes, do you want to be there when he graduates high school? I said, uh, yeah. He goes, Okay, uh, is she pregnant, huh? I go, yeah, what is she having? I said, a girl. You get to a dad, this is what you say. He goes, would you like to walk that little girl down the aisle on her wedding day, son? I went, what? What is in this scan, dude? And he goes, I want to be very clear with you, young man. I remember wow. this like yesterday. He goes, I want to be very clear with you, young man. If you continue down the road you're going, another man's going to live with your beautiful wife in your mansion, walk your son at graduation, and he's going to be arm in arm with your daughter on her wedding day, not you. You'll be long gone. <laughs> Actually, as I tell you this right now, dude, right? Wow. And he goes, what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to max out your life and your fitness. And I went, give me it. Yeah. And he gave me exactly what I needed to do. And he said, if you do this, you'll walk her down the aisle, blah, blah, blah. From that day, when I get up like I did this morning and I'm tired and I was late last night and I don't want to go to the gym, I swear to you, brother, I swear to you, I go, Bella's wedding, get your ass up. And I go, I, I'm fit because I have massive reasons. That's why I'm fit. And that started the journey towards maxing out every area of my life. I'm like, if I can do this in my fitness, I can do this in business, I can do this in my spirituality and everything. I'm not gonna shortchange myself by pretty good. I'm gonna see what my real potential is, what my maximum capacity is every single day. Because at the end of my life, when I do die, I have this belief that when I'm done, the Lord's gonna go, well done, good and faithful servant. And by the way, here's the man you could have been. This is the man you were born to be. This is the man you were destined to be. This is where you could have gone, what you could have seen, the memories you could have had, the people you could have helped, the person you could have become. Right. Meet him. My obsession is that every day I'm chasing that dude so that when I do die, we meet, we're identical twins because the bad end of a life, whether it would be at 30, 50, or 150, would be I meet that guy and we're total strangers. Yeah. So I'm obsessed with meeting that guy someday, yeah. and that's what maxing out means. Long story, but that's how Woo! it happened. Dang, and that's Uncle unbelievable. Mike is like, I've done a lot of interviews. That's that's crazy right there. So, so, talk to me about your kids for a second. I just want because you t that, that obviously there's a that that is your massive reasons. Yes. How does it feel to be such an you know a, an unbelievable father husband? Like, what's it like to build this life and have them? In I, your I don't always feel like I'm an unbelievable husband or father, by the way, because kids will humble you. Yeah. Kids don't care how famous you are, how rich you are. Yeah. In fact, my my son kind of likes dad. Pick me up in the Ferrari. My daughter yeah. hides it. Yeah. My daughter's thing is she doesn't want people to know. Dad, don't tag me. Don't say this. But what is um what is uh probably the most important thing to me in my life is I think that my children think that their daddy helps people. 
And um, what they've learned from me, both of them, is massive work ethic. Both my kids are super hardworking, good people. All I want them to have when they leave my house is I want them to have my work ethic. Yeah. I want them to have their faith, and I want them to have self-confidence, and I want them to be able to communicate. I think if you can leave a family with those things, work ethic, faith, self-confidence, and the ability to communicate, you're probably gonna have a pretty good life. It takes care of every area. Your faith's gonna make sure you're a good person and you contribute and you do well and you've got morals. Your self-confidence is obvious, work yeah. ethic is yeah. obvious, yeah. but the underestimated thing in life is the ability to communicate your thoughts and your ideas. In the world today, information is a dime a dozen. If you're going to succeed in this life, you have to be able to communicate how you're feeling and thinking and transfer information to people. And I want them to be good at that too. Those are the things I always think of with my kids. I love that. So I'm about to get into something that's been heavily weighing on my mind. It's well about all about wealth creation. As an entrepreneur, it's something that I think about because I genuinely want to amount real wealth in my life so that I could pass that down and change the whole trajectory of my family's heritage. So I want to talk to Ed, someone who's become one of the top 50 under 50 wealthiest people on our planet. How do you actually create real wealth? And I have a question. Comment below how many of you are actually saving money. Are you saving? Because if you don't save when you're broke, you sure as hell won't save when you're rich. How you how do you actually create a wealthy lifestyle? What does that mean for you? Yeah, well one, don't go broke try, don't go broke trying to look rich. That's one thing everybody's doing right now. They're yeah. going broke trying to look rich. So here's what I am. I don't care where you put the money. You know, there's guys out there saying it should be real estate, it should be the stock market. If you don't save money when you're broke, this is the thing no one's telling you. If you don't save money when you're broke, I'm talking about 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. The crazy belief system in the world is that you will save it once you make more. If you have a habit of spending, you will spend more when you make more. I know a lot of people who make a lot of money who have a Lamborghini or a car or a house that are dead broke, dead broke. You all would be shocked by who's really rich and by who's really broke. Yeah, You'd yeah. be shocked because you either are a spender or you are a saver. When I was 26 years old, I made $750,000 that year and I was living in a $750 a month apartment. Right. I saved and saved. You know what's saved. really funny? Yes. <laughs> I love yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, I had a huge moment in my life. I'll be talking about that today in my mm. speech of, of when I was up 20 million in my mid 20s, mm. lost it all. Mm. And then I had to, my mother told me this story of when basically she grew up in a studio apartment, caught on fire, they lost everything. So when I lost all that money, my mother said, you know, if I got through that, Wow. And you lost all that money, that's fine, but they won't time. take this, they won't mm. take this. And you go back out there and do it again. Now, that was a strong enough reason for me. Oh, man, yeah. And then that's what led to me starting Elite Daily. When we sold Wow, Elite that was before Daily, Elite Daily. That was before Elite Daily. Okay. When we sold Elite Daily in 2015, now, it wasn't this billion dollar exit, right? right? Still big. But it was, it was a pretty nice exit. The first thing, I, I didn't touch the money. Mm. I sent it right to a trust. Good. I maintained what I have, mm. and I lived a, I didn't change my lifestyle. In mm. fact, the only thing I bought myself mm. was this watch. Beautiful, I noticed it earlier. It's the only thing that I mm. bought myself, mm. other than the fact that I'm paying my parents' debt off, mm -hmm. surprising them with the cars of their you, dreams, paying, helping my sisters out, giving them checks to pay off their college debt, buying them a car, gosh, doing that for the family, and then going back into the North community. Mm. Um, but I think Wonderful. what you're saying is like so important because that's what I did. I, I basically, other than taking care of your, the people yeah, you love, love, I didn't, I put it away. Yes. and Because I, I know what it's like that yeah. I, I can be taken away. It can be taken away. And by the way, that's an amazing lesson, Young. And I'm so impressed with what you've done. But people say to me, well, hey, you don't understand. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Yes, I do. I lived paycheck to paycheck. Yes, I do. And the reason I don't anymore is that when I was, I found a way to save 20 bucks a month. You think, well, that's just insignificant. It is not insignificant. Why do habits apply to everybody in personal development, in yeah. fitness, in faith? But somehow when it comes to money, habits don't matter. You'll just fix those later. No. So what could you do right now to save 20 bucks a month if you're 20 years old and you're watching this? One less Starbucks run a week? Don't have direct TV? Maybe you drop your Netflix deal. What could you do? Maybe you don't you want to look cool buying bottles at the club on the weekend. You got it. Well, that's the, the, <laughs> the, the, the most devastating financial thing to young people in the world today is the club. It's all the things you do to get to the club, what you wear to dress to get to the club, and what you buy when you're in there. And just so you know, when you leave the club, nobody remembers what you bought in there.
Right. Right. So save your damn money. Let some other dumbass spend that money, and you walk around with your one drink and nurse it all night. Right. And meet somebody good. And the, and the crazy there. part is, is that most <laughs> of the time, the people that you meet are not even worth it. No. And if they met you because you bought a bottle in the club, they aren't going to be the person you want to be with long term yeah. anyway. Right. <laughs> There's cheaper ways to meet men and women anyway than spending money at the club. So anyway, I did. I did a little of that when I was young. I, I mean, we, yeah, we all did. That. We all did it. We had to go learned. through being a little. A little yeah. Bit. And then you look Reckless. at your credit card later. You're like, what the hell? hell was I thinking right yeah. there, right? You start stacking that stuff up, it's the dumbest things you could do. So my biggest thing on people is save and invest your money. Don't just save it, invest it, and only invest in things you understand. If you don't understand it, don't invest in it. The number one thing you can invest in is you, your business, your brand, your company. Then from there, only invest in things you actually understand. Until you understand it, that money sits in a bank. Don't buy stuff you don't get, yeah. and, and, and be very careful to put money into places that you completely can't explain out loud to somebody else. Yeah. So if you guys don't know, I have this whole process. It's a proven method on how I believe you can truly become a world-class leader, build a world-class brand using my math methodology. Basically how to monetize your expertise, amplify your message through the art of storytelling and speaking, and position and promote your personal brand. But I want to know, how did Ed actually build his brand? What are some of the tactics that he has implemented for him to become this world-class leader? So you are one of the greatest not just influencers, but uh, and speakers publicly Thank you. that are in the world mm -hmm. right now. For those that you know are looking to step up and become a brand yeah. right now, they they have that desire. They want to become speakers. Mm -hmm. You know what? How do you master that craft of, yeah. of being able to get into a flow and yeah. really connect with your audience? That'd be a long answer, but I'll give you a few. One, watch good ones. Watch the people that are out there. How do they deliver their message? Where do they hold their hands? I'm not saying you should copy people. I'm saying study it. Study their, their, I, I studied, because it was pre-social media, I studied preachers on TV. Wow. To this day, I watch stand-up comedians constantly. I'm addicted to it because they're funny, and I watch how they roll out a line. I watch how they deliver a message. I watch do they walk when they talk? Do they stop when they're making the important point? How do they use their hands? Do they raise their voice? Do they lower their voice? How comfortable are they with silence? So I watch people who can communicate all the time. The separation is always in the preparation. So my confidence always comes from how prepared I am when I speak. I told you earlier, I need to prepare for tomorrow. I know what I'm gonna say, but I've gotta really prepare. My confidence, the separation for me, comes in the preparation. I'll give one tip to everybody. No one will tell you when it comes to speaking, okay? Write the finish first. Write what you're going to say last first. We've all watched that person speak who can't stop. They gave a pre everyone writes, I, I better know what I'm gonna say first because I'm scared of that part. That's when I walk right. out and, whoo, hello, I'm here. So they know what they're gonna say first when they're on a stage or on Instagram, yeah. the beginning of the video. You kinda know the middle because it's the point you're gonna make. What you don't know is how to finish. That's when your video goes over the one minute line. That's when you're speaking on stage, you're like, you've said your thing, but you're trying to end on a high. You never wrote the finish. So I always start with the last one minute of my speech or the last 10 seconds of my Instagram video. That's my out every single time. If you watch a comic, the funniest joke doesn't always have to be the last one, but they always know what the last one is before they walk out on the stage first. Same with when you speak. It's the one thing nobody talks about in speaking. I always know how I'm going to finish, because it's my out. Even in our interview today, we're watching the time, right? At some point, you gotta know what the last question is. That's the end of a good interview, it's the end of a good speech, it's the end of a good Instagram video. So always write the finish first. I love it, yeah. wow. Sheesh, and um, talk to me a little bit about the legacy aspect for you. Wow, I only started to think about my legacy when the heart issue came up. And by the way, subsequent to that scan I told you earlier, I had some heart cardiac issues. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started to think about my legacy. Um, I don't need to be remembered. That's for some reason not been an important thing to me that somehow like when I'm gone, that stuff's pretty overrated to me. So I do have two legacies. The one is my family and what I want to be able to do for my children and I want them to live a better life than I've lived and I want us to make a difference in the world. It occurred to me the last five or 10 years though that like I was put on earth for a reason. There's a purpose to my existence. There's been a purpose to my journey. There's a purpose to my, my in my heart, really wanting to help people. Like I, I love it. There's, I ended up at a group home working in the beginning of my business career and it changed my life. I was working with these boys. They were all orphans and very young. I went, oh, that's my calling. I want to help. And now God's given me this platform and the ability to put words together pretty well, right? And so I want to know that my life was better for the world. I feel like the world today is so divided. What a beautiful thing it is that a dude from New Jersey who looks like you 
and is young at your age. And the dude from me, where I live, that looks like me at my age, we can collaborate. Yeah. And we can change people's lives. If you turn the television on today, you would swear we're each other's enemy. One party, one political party, your enemy is evidently people who immigrate here or Muslims or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You're the other party, a lot of times your enemy is a white guy yeah. or a successful white guy, right? It's like we're all each other's enemies. And the fact of the matter is... is and everyone's trying to label each other, put each other in a box, box. And judge each other. And it, and, it, and it feels really good short term, except it doesn't advance anybody. It doesn't advance society. It doesn't advance life. It doesn't advance humanity. And I honestly believe this, bro. I honestly believe the politicians aren't gonna change the world. I honestly believe that real people from the grassroots, I really believe entrepreneurs, social media influencers, people who have a voice in the world today, we can shift the consciousness of the world. I really believe that. Like, and so it's come to this point where like, the first half of my life was about building something special for my own family, our own legacy, and I've done that. The second half of my life is I wanna help contribute my part to changing the world. Yeah. I want my great grandchildren to live in a safer, more collaborative, more loving world, not just country. Yeah. And so I don't have a lot of really deep political beliefs. I don't mean to offend anybody on either political side of it when I say that. I don't right. have strong beliefs yeah. either way on that stuff. I have strong beliefs about humans. Yeah. I have strong beliefs about our purpose. And we were put here to help each other, to yeah. love each other, to connect with each other. It's a beautiful thing. And um, I'm so, I can be honest with you, I'm so passionate about this, bro. I sleep very little lately. Like I found my calling. Yeah. I found it. And our voices all combined, those of you listening, you and I are louder than any one politician are louder than any one country, are louder than any one little segmented, you know, little group of people who are trying to get their way in the world. We can change consciousness. We are the, the voice. We are. And what's interesting is you bring up consciousness and the theme of season four is called Conscious Creators. Mm. And wow. uh, cool. I feel that there's like this whole shift in consciousness really happening. And I've done a finale of season three and it was about people really waking up, mm. waking up to their potential, waking up to, uh, you know, waking up to, to no longer living in fear or what society has really said the, how they have to be how they have to think yeah so you know wow talk to me about wow. like how the the consciousness aspect like yeah. when did you really start to tap into the fact of you know what the energy that you're really tapping into internally that yeah. now you have this ability to go out there be an entrepreneur did it I've yeah. met so many amazing people so you know what's cool I was an athlete when you get when you're an athlete and you get on a team you don't care where someone comes from, what they look like. You are trying to win as a team, right? You're trying to elevate the consciousness of that team to right. a state of winning. And then when I got into business, I'm like, wow, entrepreneurs are the same exact way. And I feel like, look, I feel like most people in their lives are being allowed to live small. You're allowed to live a small life. Everyone around you would like you to live small. Just do this. You're good at that. Man, take it easy. Chill. When's enough enough? Like, come on, brother. You know where we're weak. We, all these messages you get is basically saying, hey, man, live small. Yeah. Life's not a big deal. Live small. Enjoy it. Chill. Smoke a little weed. Do whatever you want to want. Right? Like, it's just this get by thing yeah. in life. And there's got to be some people who go, no. No, you're supposed to do something great with your life. You were put here for a purpose. Your way, the way you were born, the way you were raised, your background, your experiences, your giftedness all prepared you in your way for right now. And you're supposed to do something great with your life. You weren't born here to be average and ordinary. And there's all this messaging that you're average and ordinary and you're average and ordinary because you belong there and it's probably someone else's fault you're average and ordinary too. And I'm like, no, it's your life. You're in control, it's no one else's fault, and you're supposed to do something magnificent. That's the consciousness aspect. The last thousand years on earth, doing something great has been reserved to this one little group of people, 1% of the population, they're supposed to do something great, they're supposed to live their dreams, we're supposed to watch them, cheer for them, wear their jersey, watch their award show, comment on their posts, clean their houses, right? Feed them in their restaurants, no! The fact of the matter is, you can do those things. You can change your life. And I'm sick and tired of this hero worship. You live small, cheer for everybody else who lives big. No, if you're a school teacher, be the best damn school teacher. Change the world by those little lives you're affecting. If you're on social media, change the world, play big. You will never do it wrong if your decision is to do the bigger thing than the smaller thing. That's what I would tell you. Stop playing small, stop thinking small, and don't let anybody tell you you should be small. Woo! Yeah. <laughs>
that's just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I fucking love that. I do too, man. I mean it. I, yeah. yeah, you know I mean it. I love it. So Ed, I'm I'm actually curious about just the story. Uh, you know, about the business. Mm -hmm. How that, you know, talk to me a little bit about how it really all began for you and then yeah. and then maybe tie that into, you know, you had this, uh, you know, a lot of early success that's led mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. um, but now you're even creating new partnerships. I know mm -hmm. Andy and you just partnered yep. with Arate. Yep. I wanted to learn about that as well because partners for me has been a huge aspect of my success. My yep. team, I owe it all to them. Me too. So can you give me a little bit of like that journey for you in business? Sure. The, the, um, everything for me is collaboration. Everything for me is a team. My whole company is predicated on building teams. But my business career started, I got out of college, I finished college, I got drafted to play professional baseball, that didn't work. Living at home at my dad's house. Broke, unemployed. My dad came home, my dad was a big drinker, he got sober. Everything in your life happens for you, not to you, right? My dad comes home from an AA meeting, goes, I got you a job. Get your ass there in the morning. I'm like, okay, what is it? He goes, it's called McKinley Home for Boys. I don't know what the hell it is. He didn't say hell. Get your ass down there in the morning. I show up there for the job. I go, yeah, I'm Eddie Milet. I'm here for the job. They're like, what job? And I'm like, I don't know. My dad sent me. Oh, your dad sent you. That's great. And you don't know what job you're here for. They're, I'm like, no, nah, I really don't know. They're like, well, come back when you know. They're like, do you even know who's hiring you? No. So I start to hit the door and I go, well... I think his name's Tim. They go, there's a lot of Tims here. And I go, well, I think he's an alcoholic. <laughs> and they go, oh, drunk Tim, Cottage 8. You're in Cottage 8. So I go off to Cottage 8. And I walked in, and it, McKinley is a campus of group homes. In other words, there's hundreds of boys all living in different homes, cottages. I walked into Cottage 8. My boys were all 7 to 10 years old. And I walked in there, and instantly those eyes are looking back at me. And I knew those eyes because I have them. Any child who grows up with any dysfunction in their family, our eyes are a little bit different. We're just kind of like, love me, man. Believe in me. Care about me. Right? Help me. And I had all those eyes looking back at me. And I thought, oh, this is where I belong. This is what I belong doing. Changing people's lives. And so I was there at Christmas when their parents weren't. I picked them up from school every day. I became their dad, their brother. And I loved it. And it altered my life because I went from being this ego achiever athlete to completely humbled and serving these boys making $6 an hour. And I loved it. About that same time, the business that I ended up building came along part-time. And that business is all about helping families out financially and building teams. You have to build wow. a team in that business, right? Recruiting and building a team. So I'm a team-made millionaire. I had to wow. learn to recruit and build a team. I'm literally a broke man financially if I did not build a team of people. So I had to learn to motivate and inspire and teach and all those things and building a team. This house is built by that team. My lake house built by that team. The Jets, all those things are built by the team yep. that I built. Yep. And so I learned early on in collaborating. So then when I went into the personal development space, I knew I had to collaborate. So I sought out the right people to build them. my support team around me, their audiences. You know, I do their show, yep. they do my show, yep. posting, et cetera, just like what we're doing right now. And so I believe everything in business nowadays is team built. There's a misnomer that someone is self-made right yeah. there's all these people out there that are working out of their homes right now you cannot name a single successful human being in the history of mankind who didn't build a team Jesus Christ built a team he built a team he had his apostles for a reason that was his frontline team and then they built the team there's nobody ever in life who has built anything extraordinary with their life alone ever period you must collaborate you must build a team even the greatest religions in the world were all built by teams of people. So clearly you in your living room right now need to seat out some help, some teammates, and some collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. God's work. Yeah. Ed Milet, thank you so much, brother, for coming and sharing with My us. My pleasure, bro. I can't wait to just build a lifelong friendship with you. That's what we're going to have. You're a true leader. Thanks, thank you, brother. Thanks, man. Love you, man. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Ed Milet. He's one of the most amazing world-class leaders that I've ever had the opportunity to spend time with and meet. His character is bar none at the highest standard of what I expect a leader to, how to show up in the world. The way he treated his team, the way he treated me, so inspiring. Hopefully you had some takeaways here on things that you can actually put into action into your own life. How to amount real success, real wealth, how to become a real brand, how to be able to build a team, how to bounce back from some of your lowest moments. You know, 
whether it's your loneliness, depression, or even what Ed went through, which is like at the lowest point where he was broke and had to actually shower at a public pool with his newly, you know, what his new wife. Like he really had to overcome a lot to then becoming so successful. And I want that for each and every one of you. So hopefully you had some takeaways. Let me know what those takeaways are. Let me know how it impacted you. Let Ed know how it's impacted you. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. Share, subscribe. It's your boy GA here in Vegas. Peace.